positive. So what you have to consider is uh, either all of them are positive or uh, exactly one of them is negative or exactly two are negative. Because if you go on to three, then you can just multiply by minus one and you get the same types. Okay, so that's, uh, these are the only situations which we have to uh, consider. Moreover, if we look at, if we look at, uh, at those two equations, uh, we see that, for instance, if you take this one, if one of the coefficients is equal to zero, for instance, uh, j is equal to zero, then what you get is a cylinder, and we exclude cylinders from our classification. So here for the second equation, we can assume that all of them, a, b, c, a, a, b, j, all the uh, coefficients are not equal to zero. And for the first one, uh, there is only one possibility, one possible choice. Uh, uh, there's only one possibility of a parameter being equal to zero, uh, where we uh, do not get a cylinder, and this is the case, k is equal to zero. So if k is equal to zero, we get uh, this is the only way those, one of those uh, uh, three uh, coefficients is equal to zero, because otherwise you always get a cylinder. So the only case where you do not get a cylinder, k is equal to zero. So this is one type of uh, a quadratic surface. Okay, so the first type is uh, uh, you take something like uh, Okay, so k is equal to zero. Okay, of course, uh, a, b, and c, uh, it's not possible that they are all uh, positive, because uh, then you talk about nothing, okay, because you do not have any x, y, and z which satisfy this equation. So the first possible type is, uh, okay, so you have something like this here. And uh, this type is called the cone. Okay, so the first possible type of the quadratic surface is the cone. Of course, you, you might have here different, a, a, b, and c might have different values, but then you uh, uh, essentially get the same. Uh, quadratic, quadratic surface, the same type, and we are just interested in the classification. Okay, so this is the first type. Then the second type is, uh, okay, from now on we can uh, assume that all the coefficients not equal to zero, okay, for the classification. And we, now we look at this first equation, okay, so how many types do we have coming from the first equation? Now, it's not possible, of course, that all of them are larger than zero, because then, I mean, it's possible, but then you talk about nothing, because you do not have any x, y, and z which satisfy such an equation. So you can exclude this case. So there are only two situations left. Either one of them, exactly one of them is negative, or exactly two of them are negative. Okay, so these are the only cases which are, uh, which are left. Now, uh, if uh, exactly one is uh, negative, you have two different possibilities. Either this is negative, or one of those here is negative. Okay, because this leads to a different type. But if you, if for instance, this one is positive, this one is positive, this one is positive, and this one negative, this, of course, is the same type as you choose uh, uh, this one negative and the other three positive. You get the same, but you just interchange uh, the variables. Okay, so uh, you see that uh, uh, if uh, one of them is negative, only exactly one of them is negative, you have two possibilities. This one is negative, all others are positive, or this one is negative and all others are positive. These are essentially two different types. Okay, so you get... Uh, we look at an example for all of those types. I, uh, last time... This is example one, which gives you the first type. And example two, which gives you the second type, is okay. We choose case is negative. All of them are positive. So in this uh, uh, situation, you get, uh, for instance, this one. Okay, so this one I already uh, uh, discussed last time. So here, if you look at cross sections, cross sections once more are the uh, curves you get if you. Uh, uh, slice uh, the surface by planes which are parallel to the coordinate planes. And no matter how you do it here, you always get ellipses. Okay, so in this situation, uh, all, the tr all the cross sections are ellipses. So this looks more like an egg. So uh, this surface looks like an egg, and this, this is called ellipsoid. Okay, the name coming from the cross sections, because all the cross sections are ellipses. So this, this is the first. Uh, the first, uh, uh, you can say, non-trivial type. So we have already two. One is the cone, one is the ellipsoid. Now, uh, the next situation. The next situation would be the one where, where this now is, so again, you, only one of them is negative. So for instance, you choose the C negative and all others positive. This would be the next possibility. So for instance, you have something like, uh, uh, let's say x square plus uh, y square uh, over 4 
is equal to, so, so this one is negative, uh, okay, so you have something like z square minus 1. Okay, so here in this, it, maybe I should write it first. You, you see that this, this corresponds to the case where uh, this one here is negative, all others are positive. And this corresponds to the case where this one is negative, all others are positive. Okay, so you have this one. Okay, so you see, uh, this is one type here, so we uh, rewrite the equation to x squared plus y squared over 4 is equal to z squared minus 1. Okay, so you see that uh, uh, actually you just get here solutions uh, if uh, set is larger or equal than 1, uh, or the absolute, uh, sorry, the absolute value of set is larger or equal than 1. Now, uh, if we look at cross sections, okay, so you fix, a set, you fix a set which is equal to k, and of course you must have that the absolute value of k is larger or equal than 1. Okay, otherwise uh, you talk about, uh, you, you do not get any solutions for x and y. Uh, okay, so uh, if you slice with these planes parallel to the xy plane, okay, in certain distance, distance k uh, to the xy plane, uh, then uh, uh, what do you get? Uh, so you have uh, x squared plus y squared over 4 is equal to uh, k squared minus 1. Okay, so as cross sections, you get uh, ellipses. Okay, so this is this case. Okay, so these are, these are cross sections which are parallel to the x, y plane. Okay, now if you look at other cross sections, uh, so for instance, another possibility would be okay, you choose y is equal to some constant. Uh, you can say another one. So let's call this k1 and this k2. Okay, so in this situation, what do you get? Uh, so then you have x square minus z uh, uh, square is equal to, and you have k2 square over 4 minus 1. OK? So you, you see, in this case, you get, uh, no matter how you choose k2, the traces or the cross sections are uh, hyperbolas. Okay, and if you look at cross sections uh, which are, because of the symmetry, if you look at cross sections which are parallel to the y set plane, what you get are hyperbolas as well. So you get in two cases hyperbolas, uh, and in one case ellipses. Now this this type is called hy hyperboloid, and because uh, uh, you, because you see that uh, hi uh, hyperbola is this what is dominating here if you look at cross sections. So you get twice hyperbolas. Uh, that's why it's, the guy is called hyperboloid, and uh, because uh, in, the, in the case where you slice with a plane which is parallel to the xy plane, you get the ellipse. So this guy is called elliptic hy hyperboloid. OK, so this one is called elliptic hyperboloid. Also, hyperboloid of two of two sheets. So maybe I should. Or actually, this is the more common name is hyperboloid. Of two sheets. The reason the reason why you have. Uh, why it's called of two of two sheets is because uh, you see that uh, uh, you have to you have to move up with with z. Z has to be either uh, larger or equal than one or smaller or equal than minus one, such that uh, uh, you get el ellipses as cross sections. Okay, so you, ca you can roughly imagine how this guy looks like here. Uh, Okay, if, so in, in this case, if uh, uh, if you slice with a plane which is parallel to the x pla x y plane, and in distance at least one, then you get ellipses. In all other cases, you get hyperbolas. So this will roughly look like you have something like this here, and you have something which is symmetric. Uh, you have a part which is symmetric to this one. OK, 
Okay, so something like this here. That's why it's called the hyper hyper hyperboloid of two sheets. Okay, so we have already now s three types uh, identified the cone ellipsoid hyperboloid of two sheets. Now let's go back to our equa our original equation. So the equation which we are discussing at the moment is this one, this type of equation. Okay, so we have already the case where uh, exactly one of them is. Uh, uh, so you have exactly one of them is uh, negative, all others are positive. Uh, now, uh, the next case would be, okay, two of them are uh, negative, okay, and the other two are, uh, are positive. Uh, and of course, you can, without loss of generality, you can assume that those two here are the ones which are uh, negative. Okay, so you get another type, which is example four. Okay, where this one and this one are both negative. Okay, so you have something like, if we take this one and just vary it, then we have x squared, x squared plus y squared over 4 minus z squared minus 1 is equal to 0. Okay. Or in other words, you have uh, x squared plus y squared over 4 is equal to z squared plus 1. And this one, actually, pretty similar to this one. The only difference is that if you slice, now uh, you can choose any any planes which are parallel to the xy plane, you always get ellipses because of this plus one here. But if you slice, so if you slice parallel to the xy plane, you always get ellipses. If you slice parallel to the yz plane, you get, uh, as in this case, hyperbolas. If you, if you slice parallel to the xz plane, you get also hyperbolas. Okay. So this one is similar to this one, but those two pieces grow together. Okay. So this is called the hyperboloid of one sheet. Okay, now we have already four types. So we have already the cone, we have already the ellipsoid, we have the hyperboloid of one sheet, and the hyper hyper hyperboloid of two sheets. And these are all the types which arise from such an equation, as we have discussed already, because others, other types uh, just correspond to more or less, uh, uh, you have different coefficients, which means you stretch, in the, you stretch it in the three, uh, three coordinate axis, and you might have, uh, uh, the distribution of the two signs here might be different, but uh, for instance, if you if you have this one, if this one is negative and this one is negative, essentially the same. You just uh, interchange uh, uh, coordinate axes names. Okay, it's just different names. So you see that from from this equation we got four four different types. Now what is left is the other equation. Okay, so what is left is the other equation, which is ax squared plus by squared plus, uh, I don't remember, j, jz is equal to zero. I think it was this one. So how many types do we get from this equation? Now, uh, as I have already explained, all of them, a b, and c, a, b, and j, must be not equal to zero. Now, you, uh, without loss of generality, you can assume that j is negative, because otherwise, uh, uh, if j is positive or negative, essentially leads to the same type because here the, s the sign is taken into account. So you can assume that j is negative, and then you just so it, you just can vary the sign here. Of course, uh, you do not have to consider both are negative. So you, you you just have both positive or one of them is negative. Two types. Okay. So you see that. Uh, one possibility would be okay. This one is negative. And both of them are positive. This would be one type. So, for instance, you have uh, uh, 2x squared plus y squared minus z is equal to 0. Okay. O of course, you can also rewrite this uh, to z is equal to 2x squared plus y squared. So, you see that uh, if you look at cross sections which are parallel to the xy plane, so z is equal to k, of course, k must be larger or equal than 0. Otherwise, you do not have any solutions. Uh, OK, so for this situation, you get uh, 2x squared plus y squared is equal to k as cross sections. So the cross sections are ellipses. 
Now, uh, if you if you if you either look at cross sections with respect to the xy plane or respect with uh, with planes which are parallel to the xy plane or par uh, planes which are parallel to the yz plane, which means you either fix x or y is a constant, then you see you always get par parabolas. Okay, so uh, if uh, x is equal to l1, then cross sections or y is equal to l2 uh, cross sections are always are parabolas okay so you see that uh, uh, like per uh, kind of parabola is like dominating okay so this ki this ki this guy is called paraboloid, and because uh, in one of the uh, uh, in in the final case as cross sections you get ellipses, so it's called the elliptic paraboloid. Okay, so this one is called elliptic paraboloid, and actually also quite easy to imagine how it how how the surface looks like. Because you see, this is this more or less looks like a cup. Okay, so you have something like this here. Okay, so the elliptic par paraboloid is is another type. And now, because of our discussion of the sign, only one type is left. Okay, and this type is the one where uh, uh, either one of them is negative, and this one is negative as well. So you see the the final type. Final type is this one. Set is equal to x square minus y square. Okay, so this is the last one. Now you see that uh, if you set z is equal to k1, then you see the cross sections are hyperbolas. And again, if you set uh, if you set x is equal to l one or uh, y is equal to l two, then you see that the cross section cross sections are parabolas. Okay, so again, uh, this you would call this guy paraboloid as here, but because in this case, uh, in the third case, the cross sections are hyperbolas, so this guy will be called hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay, hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay, so uh, the reason why I explain this in such details is because this helps you to memorize the name. Okay, you do not have to uh, uh, just learn it. Uh, uh, you can memorize it by looking at this rule here. So when, because of this, because if you look at this equation here, you see that in uh, two cases you get parabolas as cross sections. In one case you get el ellipses. So this guy is called elliptic paraboloid. Okay, so it's very easy to memorize the, me the names here. Okay, you just have to. Uh, actually, you do not have to memorize uh, which equation corresponds to which type. Okay, so you have just to look at the cross sections. Okay, and uh, if you get in two cases uh, parab uh, parabolas, then the guy is called paraboloid. You have just to look what happens in the third case. Uh, if you get the ellipse, elliptic paraboloid. If it is a hyperbola, hyperbolic paraboloid. If you get in two cases hyperbolas, it's called a hy hy hyperboloid, and it depends on the third coordinate whether you have two sheets or one sheet and then it's the cone which is which is left and, and the ellipsoid and these are all types which are which are possible and this kind of classification is the same uh, actually you have done this in high school maybe your teacher hasn't explained to you in details that the ellipse the paraboloid and the uh, hyperbola are all possible uh, quadratic curves okay so maybe this was not so emphasized in high school because you just learned learned the three types okay uh, maybe not really 
learning why they are why they are important because the, 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 the reason is like if you look here at the simple quadratic equation in three variables okay the, uh, the, you ask the question which kind of curves arise from such quadratic which kind of surfaces in this case arise from such quadratic equations and doing this classification you see that essentially there are six types and if you do the same in uh, in the plane so if you uh, look at uh, quadratic equations uh, which are uh, in, in two variables, not in three, x and y, and you ask, okay, which kind of types do you get? Then you will get as answer three of them, ellipse, uh, hyperbola, uh, uh, parabola. Th those three types are in the plane, and these are the corresponding types in the space. Okay, so maybe it's good to make a summary. So I have, I have a This is also the table you find in our textbook. So maybe Actually, I showed you all of them, uh, uh, how the graph looks like. All of them are quite easy to imagine. Maybe this is the only one which is not so easy to imagine, uh, hy hyperbolic paraboloid. Uh, so here you see, but if you, if you look at this picture, you see that, uh, uh, once more, if you look at the name, uh, as I have explained, the name, the name means that uh, if you look at the, last, at, at the last name of this guy, okay, paraboloid, then uh, uh, this guy has the name paraboloid because uh, two of the possible three cross sections are parabolas. Okay, and the, the, uh, where are the parabolas? If you slice with planes which are parallel to the xz plane, and if you slice with planes which are parallel to the yz plane, you always get parabolas. Okay, that's 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 the surname of this guy. Okay, so that's that's why the guy is called paraboloid. And now the first name of this guy is coming from the from the fact that if you uh, slice with planes which are parallel to the xy plane, okay, then you always get hyperbolas. So it's called hy hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay, so that's the important thing. Because you see in our textbook, you have this classification. So here, once more, all the possible types. So you have this classification in, also in our textbook. Uh, so this is the first one. Uh, this corresponds to, the, uh, to one of the two equations uh, where you have uh, only once one uh, uh, coefficient is negative, and the coefficient which is negative is a constant one. So here you have a uh, ellipsoid, and all the all the traces, all the uh, cro or cross sections, traces and cross sections, the same word. So all the traces are ellipses. Okay, so this was the first one. Then this one is the second one. So here uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, that the traces uh, uh, which are parallel to the xy plane are ellipses. Uh, and all other traces, parabolas. So this guy is called elliptic paraboloid. Now, uh, this one we just saw, so this is the hyperbolic paraboloid. Uh, here's the cone, uh, which is the only one where one of the coefficients in the two equations which you see in our textbook is, uh, is equal to zero, the only possibility. So this is the usual uh, cone. Actually, you could merge the cone and the next two into one because uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, this is like this is like the cone, but uh, uh, you have at, uh, you have a set set is equal to zero, not just one point. Okay, you have a, a ellipse or circle uh, in some special cases. Uh, this is the hyperboloid of one sheet, and here you have the hyperboloid of two sheets. And the, ma the, the main important thing is okay, what you should have learned is you ha you do not have to memorize all those equations, okay, and the names, the corresponding names. Because it's easy to, to uh, figure out for every given an equation, you can just look at the cross sections. And just by looking at the cross sections, it's easy to figure out how the, how the, gu how the guy is called. OK, so this is something you do not have to memorize. Okay? It's just, you just have to, ev every time you have given an equation, you look at the cross sections, and you can easily, from the cross sections, you can figure out which kind of type uh, is it. OK, now uh, maybe it's. Uh, this is a good time to because I haven't pl I haven't showed you uh, I ha haven't shown you in this class uh, how to use Maple to plot uh, surfaces in the space and Maple is a very powerful tool uh, for for doing this and you will see in a minute why. Uh, so uh, we saw already last semester that there is a comment which is the, the usual comment for plotting uh, graphs. Sorry. The usual the usual. Uh, comment for plotting graphs is plot. Now you have a plot 3D, which is the same, but for plotting surfaces in the three-dimensional space, or in the space. Uh, okay, so this one. 
No? Uh, so maybe let's, let's look at this one here. So, uh, sorry. I do. I, I don't have to write the set. So I just write x square minus y square, and I tell Maple a plotting window. Uh, now for two coordinates, uh, for two variables. So I go for, for instance, from minus two to two, and y from uh, minus two to two. Okay. So uh, this is a plot of Maple uh, for the. For this guy, the hyperbolic paraboloid. Now uh, you will see, you will see why maple. So, so uh, if maple would just plot it, okay, for uh, if it is in the plane, okay, s uh, plotting is much easier in the plane, okay, because in the plane you, uh, you you plot something you see already the uh, all the properties of the graph. But if you plot something in the space, okay, because it's plotted on on in the plane, okay, so. Uh, just from some, from a plot from a plot like this, you m might not be immediately be able to grasp, okay, what is what are the properties of such a surface, okay? So it would be nice if you if you can if you would be able to rotate it or to take it and take it in a position you want, and Maple can do this. Uh, so th and th th that's really the reason why Maple is very powerful for plotting something like this, because you just have to take it like this, and then you you can uh, you you click, and then you can look at it from different angles, okay? So that's that's really that should be convincing why you should use Maple in order to uh, uh, plot something like this. Because even if you try to plot it on the blackboard, okay, you can just you can just choose one viewing angle, okay. But uh, with Maple, you will be immediately you will see uh, what are the properties uh, of such a surface. So this is for this one. Now, uh, so if you haven't if you haven't uh, used Maple yet, uh, you should start it. You should start to use it from now in order to get a better grasp of uh, uh, surfaces in the three-dimensional space. So we saw another one. This one, x squared plus y squared over 4 is equal to like z squared plus 1. So let's choose this one. OK. Now, you see here's a little bit different uh, t because uh, uh, you see for the plotting comment, OK, normally what I have to give Maple is a function of two variables, x and y. Okay, and Ma Maple will know, okay, the third coordinate, which I do, do not have to write, it's a set, okay. Now, uh, for this one, okay, uh, of course you could, you could solve it first for set, but then you would have two different surfaces, okay, which you have to plot in the same window. It's not so nice, but uh, uh, of course it's doable. But a better option is uh, to use the implicit plot command. So you have, uh, I told you already last semester that, uh, okay, you can use this with comment to, uh, Get a couple of more uh, plotting comments. So these are the, these are all the plotting comments which Maple provides. Uh, now there is uh, there is one implicit plot, implicit plot 3D, which is for plotting curves, which are given, which are not given explicitly, but given like this here by implicit equation. So uh, we will use this one. Now uh, we just key in. Now we can just key, key in the equation is equal to z square plus 1. OK, and we have also to tell uh, Maple over which, uh, over which window uh, does Maple, uh, should Maple plot uh, this function. Now, uh, uh, so the easiest thing is we look at it first from the set coordinates. So for instance, we choose, if we choose set from uh, minus 1 to 1, OK, then the right hand side is, uh, is the largest possible value is 2, and x and y we choose uh, such that we get also the largest possible value of z. Okay, so that's the, that's the way we choose this. Uh, so uh, the last one is actually z, so z from minus 1 to 1. Now we, uh, we still have to choose uh, x and y, but once we have chosen z, x and y, the range for x and y is clear because, uh, uh, okay, for x then, because the largest possible value is 2, so x then from minus square root of 2 to square root of 2. Here, if you use the implicit plot comment, this is the disadvantage. You have to think a little bit about the uh, plotting window, okay? Otherwise, you will you, maybe you if you choose if you do not cho choose the plotting window good enough, then you might get a surface which does not reflect what you want to have because maybe you lose some symmetry and so on. Okay, so this one and uh, uh, and for for y we have uh, from square root of eight from minus square root of eight to square root of eight.
uh, I forgot the, so you always have to, uh, the, the, the last thing is always this, this semicolon. Okay, so you see this is, you see this is now the, this is now the hyper hyperboloid of uh, uh, two sheets, uh, of one sheet, sorry. And similarly, you can plot others, uh, like the hyper hyperboloid of one sheet and so on. Okay, so any questions to this? I will, I will show you today, if time permits much, much more, uh, we will also plot other uh, uh, surfaces uh, using Maple. Okay, so, so before we go on to vector functions, to chapter 13, uh, we still have to discuss uh, uh, one more topic in chapter 11, which is uh, uh, so-called cylindrical and spherical coordinates, which are uh, sometimes better than uh, Cartesian or rectangular coordinates. Spherical. Okay, so this is pretty similar to what we have done in the plane. In the plane, we have uh, uh, ex uh, we have used the, most of the time Cartesian coordinates. But we saw that uh, uh, in some cases uh, uh, it's better to use uh, polar coordinates. Uh, in particular, if things like uh, if you want to describe the circle, uh, then it's uh, uh, the equation, the defining equation of the circle gets much much easier in polar coordinates where it's only r is equal to one compared to the uh, Cartesian coordinates where it's x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Now, also in the uh, space we have something similar. Uh, so called we have two different types uh, uh, so except the usual Cartesian or rectangular coordinates we have two different other types of coordinates uh, which are cylindrical and spherical coordinates uh, now uh, cylindrical coordinates uh, uh, actually uh, so uh, the rectangular coordinates you will use you are going to use normally this coordinate system okay so you have the three coordinate axes which are perpendicular to each other and uh, you represent a point uh, uh, as the distances from the three axes. These are the rectangular or Cartesian coordinates. Now, uh, for cylindrical coordinates, uh, you almost do the same, but the only difference is that, okay, if this is the point here, then uh, you keep the set coordinates, uh, but uh, uh, you project the point down onto the xy plane. And for the x and y coordinate, you do not use the usual x and y coordinate, you use uh, 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 you lose. Uh, so, so here we use uh, polar coordinates. So we have here the radius, and we have here our angle theta. So th th this is almost the same as uh, uh, what we have done in the plane. Uh, so the only the only difference here is that in the x y plane you use uh, polar coordinates, uh, and you keep the set axis. Uh, so in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, uh, the coordinate, if you give uh, the cylindrical coordinates of a point, okay, they are interpreted different. Uh, okay, so you have, uh, like, uh, you in cylindrical coordinates, you will give the r, the theta, and you will give the set. Okay, and then you say uh, the point is given in cylindrical coordinates, and you interpret it like this here. Okay, so these are cylindrical coordinates. The name, the name should be uh, pretty clear because. Uh, uh, if you look at if you look at this uh, surface in cylindrical coordinates, okay, what do you get? Uh, uh, so, or, or for instance, this one. So, if you look at this uh, uh, surface, uh, then the radius is always constant. So, uh, if you slice this surface with uh, uh, gr uh, with planes which are parallel to the xy plane, then you always get a circle of radius one, uh, and the, uh, no matter how you choose. Uh, uh, the distance to the xy plane. So what you get is a circular cylinder. Okay, so you see that the, that the uh, representation of the circular cylinder uh, in cylindrical coordinates becomes very easy. Just r is equal to one. Okay, so a a another example would be. Uh, Okay, so this one, r is r square minus. Uh, so this is an example. Okay, 
uh, r square minus 2 z square is equal to 4. So if you have a surface uh, given by this equation in cylindrical coordinates, okay, which, which surface is it? Uh, no, uh, of course, you can easily convert to the usual rectangular coordinates. You just replace r square by x square plus y square. So, uh, so this is in cylindrical coordinates, and in uh, Cartesian coordinates, you would get x square plus y square minus 2z square is equal to 4. Okay, so you see that uh, this surface in cylindrical coordinates uh, is this surface in rectangular coordinates, and this surface is this one, okay, more or less. Uh, so uh, this surface is the hyperboloid of, two, of one sheet. Okay, so, so this surface in cylindrical coordinates uh, in, in cylindrical coordinates uh, is the hyperboloid of two sheets. Okay. Now, uh, another example would be okay. Uh, uh, if you if you look at, for instance, uh, if you look at this surface x square plus y square plus z square plus two uh, z is equal to zero. But now in uh, cylindrical uh, in in re in rect rectangular or in uh, Cartesian coordinates. So we know that in Cartesian coordinates, this surface uh, uh, is the sphere. Okay. Now, uh, if we uh, uh, introduce, uh, for instance, uh, cylindrical coordinates, okay, then this surface becomes uh, r square because we re we replace this here by r square. So r square plus z square plus two z is equal to zero. Or you can also write this as r square plus, and then you have z plus 1 square is equal to 1. So uh, in, s in cylindrical coordinates, this surface uh, would also represent uh, a sphere. OK, so this uh, is uh, here you see how you go from uh, a surface given in cylindrical coordinates to the surface in uh, Cartesian coordinates. And here you see the other way around. You see an, an example for a surface uh, uh, which is uh, m uh, maybe more complicated in uh, Cartesian coordinates uh, would be the cone. Because uh, if you look at the cone, then we have seen this is the equation of the cone. Okay, And uh, if you go now to uh, uh, cylindrical coordinates, then th this equation becomes z squared is equal to r squared. Or uh, actually, you have two solutions, z is equal to r and z, z is equal to minus r. You shouldn't forget that for polar coordinates, we always allow that. Also, we also allow that r is negative. Okay. So here you get uh, uh, z is equal to r and z is equal to minus r. But actually, they are the same surface. Okay. So you see that uh, uh, this equation in cylindrical coordinates uh, gives you the cone, the usual cone. Okay. You, so you see, in, in cylindrical coordinates, the cone will be much more easier. And this also roughly already tells you how to uh, uh, when to apply cylindrical coordinates, uh, namely whenever you have uh, 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 very roughly speaking, if you have uh, a symmetry about some axis, uh, then uh, most of the time, like the cylinder, circular cylinder is symmetric here. The symmetry axis of the s of the circular cylinder is the set axis. Also, the symmetry axis of the cone is the set axis. Uh, and often, if the symmetry axis uh, is uh, if you have a symmetry axis uh, of a given surface, uh, then introducing uh, cylindrical coordinates will make things more easier. Okay, these are cylindrical coordinates, so they're not, they're not so much different from uh, 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 Cartesian coordinates and uh, uh, and the corresponding uh, uh, polar coordinates. Because here you just have uh, in one in one uh, coordinate plane uh, you use polar coordinates and you keep the third coordinate. Now, another, another type of coordinates are so-called spherical coordinates. OK, so this is li a little bit different. Uh, so uh, this is, again, the Cartesian coordinate system. And uh, uh, we, again, have a point, P. 
Okay. The usual way to uh, uh, introduce coordinates is the distances at x at the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. Uh, but now what we use is uh, okay. So we we look at look at this ray from from zero to the point, uh, and th uh, uh, the length of this uh, uh, line segment is called rho. And uh, uh, as another uh, coordinate, we use here the angle which this uh, uh, line segment makes with the z-axis. Uh, we call this uh, phi. And then we have a third one, so we, pro we project uh, the point onto the xy plane. And then we, have, uh, then we have here an angle which we call theta. Okay. So here we will denote, uh, uh, of, or we will describe the point P by the three coordinates you see here, so rho, theta, and psi. Okay, and uh, what we need is that the rho is uh, larger or equal than zero. So th this is different from the uh, polar coordinates. Polar coordinates, their radius can be also negative. Okay, here not. Uh, then the uh, theta is, uh, uh, you see this fr from here, so between zero and pi, and uh, the theta will be between zero and two pi. Okay, so this two pi you can exclude it, and here you can also one of them you can exclude it. Okay, so these are spherical coordinates, and of course it's easy to convert between sp spherical coordinates and uh, 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 rectangular or Cartesian coordinates. Uh, so you see, for instance, if you have given the spherical coordinates of a point, uh, uh, then uh, you can compute the rectangular coordinates of the point. If, uh, first set is the most easiest one. So for set, you have uh, uh, rho times uh, the cosine of psi. And then uh, for x and y, you project it down. Uh, so you have uh, x is equal to uh, rho times the sine of psi, which is this length here. And then you have the, user, the usual uh, uh, polar coordinates, cosine of theta. And for y, you have rho times sine of psi, and you have the sine of theta. OK, so this would, this would be the way you, if you have given a point in uh, spherical coordinates, you can use those three equations to compute the corresponding rectangular coordinates. And also the other way is uh, uh, easily, easily derived. You can find it in our textbook. But the other way, as for polar coordinates, it uh, doesn't give you a unique way to find the uh, corresponding spherical coordinates. Okay, so you see, for instance, as an example, this just takes some a little bit practice in order to understand if you have given a, a surface in uh, spherical coordinates. Okay, how does the surface look looks like in uh, in uh, in Cartesian coordinates? Uh, so, for instance, if you have given this one, rho times the cosine of theta is equal to two. It just looks more complicated in sphere. So, in spherical coordinates. But you see, because rho times cosine of theta is just a set, so what you have is that uh, this is just a plane which is parallel to the xy plane with distance 2. So it just looks more complicated uh, here. Another example would be uh, uh, the sphere we just saw, uh, which was given in Cartesian coordinates or rectangular coordinates by the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus uh, two set is equal to zero. So how to convert it to uh, uh, spherical coordinates? Uh, you see that, uh, uh, of course, x squared plus y squared plus z squared must be equal to rho squared plus two times. And then you just take this one, so rho uh, cosine of uh, uh, psi is equal to zero. So you see that uh, rho is equal to minus two uh, cosine of psi. So if you, if you have given uh, such an equation here in spherical coordinates, then this will describe the sphere. Uh, but here, the center of the sphere is not in the, co in the origin. Of course, if the center is in the origin, much easier the equation. Uh, in this case, uh, the sphere is described by rho is constant, which also gives the spherical coordinates its name. That's why they are called spherical coordinates, because the sphere is described very easily. Okay, now, uh, of course, maple can plot also uh, surfaces in, if they are given in 
sphere, spherical coordinates, uh, so something like this, uh, this here, or in uh, cylindrical coordinates. Uh, uh, just by you, but, but of course, what you have to tell Maple is that your coordinates are now spherical coordinates or cylindrical coordinates. So for instance, uh, uh, if you have the following example, so plot the surface of intersection of uh, which one? And uh, uh, not the surface of intersection, sorry, the surface uh, which is bounded by. Now this one, set is equal to x square plus y square, and set is equal to 5 minus x square minus y square. You see, uh, both of them are quadratic surfaces, the same type, OK? Because uh, uh, you see that, uh, uh, once more, you see, uh, for instance, for this one, how do you figure out the type? If you uh, slice with a plane which is parallel to the yz plane, you get a parabola. If you slice with a plane which is parallel to the xz plane, you get a parabola. So it's a parab paraboloid. And if you slice with a plane which is parallel to the xy plane, you get, get a circle or ellipse in general. So this one is the elliptic paraboloid, and this one as well. So it's called, this is the elliptic paraboloid. So you have two elliptic paraboloids, and you should plot the surface which is uh, uh, bounded by them. Now, uh, one way to do this, because you see that uh, you have here a symmetry axis, which is the set axis. Uh, so it's, uh, the, uh, both of the equations here get simpler uh, if you introduce uh, uh, cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so in cylindrical coordinates, uh, this one is set is equal to r square, and this one is uh, set is equal to 5 minus r square. But you, uh, what you have to figure out is the range over which you have to plot them. Okay, now for, uh, for the range, you have to find the point of intersection of them. Okay, this will be the largest r. So uh, if 5 minus r square is equal to r square, then the largest r is uh, reached. Uh, so r is equal to plus minus uh, uh, square root of 5 half. And of course, we just have to plot. So, so this one from uh, just for positive r will be enough because of symmetry uh, up to square root of 5 half. And this one as well with r from 0 to square root of 5 half. OK, now uh, how to do this with maple? So you can uh, hear different ways to do this. Uh, uh, one way to do this is you just use the normal plot comment. Uh, and uh, if you want to figure out more about the comment, uh, uh, sorry, if you want to understand the comment in more details, what you can do is you can ask for help. So uh, if you want to. Uh, know more about plot 3D. In particular, if you are interested to figure out okay, how to uh, plot the uh, surface which is not given in Cartesian coordinates, but in, in like here, cylindrical coordinates. Uh, now, uh, you, you f uh, for every comment, you have here a long, long description. And uh, you can read the description. So let's check how to do this. The most easiest thing is you just look at the examples. Uh, no, there is no corresponding example uh, here. Here, so you have something like co. Uh, you see, like you see, if if you look at this one, okay, then. Uh, but you can also read the stuff above, okay. But the way I do it is looking at the examples. Uh, so you see that you have uh, a comment here which you add at the end, which is called coordinate coordinates. And here you have spherical, so there should also be something like cylindrical. So we try this one. Of course, it normally you have to figure out as well uh, uh, what is the if you have cylindrical coordinates because you have three coordinates the r the theta and the set okay but uh, if we use the plot 3D comment okay then 
normally you have to uh, uh, you give the equation explicitly, okay? But uh, uh, you have to figure out what does it mean, okay? Explicitly. But here for coordinates, uh, uh, for spherical for cylindrical coordinates, it means set is equal to a function of r and theta. This is the description uh, which uh, uh, Maple expects. Okay. But you have you see you have here much more details. Uh, uh, this uh, is actually part of this should be plot 3D options. Uh, so you have here explanation of the options, and you can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, you see, you can define grid styles and so on. You can give labels. Uh, uh, but where is the coordinate? I didn't see it. It should be here. You see, you have coordinates. Okay, this is one of the comments. Uh, Coordinate is equal to C, and you see that uh, the default is Cartesian. And for other coordinate systems, okay, I have to go to another help page. Uh, but you see that you have your explanation. So you can do many, many things with Maple. Like you can also, uh, if you want to understand how, so how a surface looks like, you can place a light somewhere, and you see the shadow, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you have all kinds of all kinds of uh, possibilities to play around. Okay, so let's but let's try to do this. So. Uh, what we want to do is, uh, okay, we want to plot uh, those two here, okay, in, so maybe let's, let's first plot this one, so uh, both of them, as I have explained, are elliptic uh, uh, paraboloids, uh, let's first plot the first one, so for r from 0 to uh, uh, square root of uh, 5 half uh, uh, and coordinates are uh, uh, cylindrical. Okay, s what is the problem? I cannot really see what the problem is. Why pay bad range of arguments? So. I'm Of course, if I if I do it like this, uh, maybe maybe it's uh, what is the problem? What has uh, I'm not sure what the problem is. Wait a moment. Uh, it should at least. Uh, okay, so let's let's maybe. I'm not sure whether this expression is a is a problem here. But it's not a problem for the new version of Maple. Uh, let's try this. Mm. There is the problem. I cannot find it. Ah, because uh, there is. Ah, ah I know. Uh, okay. This was very stupid because uh, I have to give. Uh, the, the problem is pretty clear because uh, there must be two parameters. Okay. Now this is one of them. It, is, it should be. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's really because this this is not the right one. Uh, uh, so I have to check. Sorry, I have to check whether. Because it, it depends whether, mm, uh, obviously, Maple does not interpret uh, this expression. Because you see, this is obviously wrong. So obviously, 
uh, Maple does not interpret uh, cylindrical coordinates uh, uh, in this form here. Yeah, maybe the R is the main one, and R is a function of Z and uh, Zeta. So I had to write it like this here, dot 3D. Oh yeah, you see it here, the, uh, that's what I feared, because you see that R uh, it, uh, you see uh, this line here, so uh, actually it's not in this form here, but it's in this form, r is equal to, and then you have f of uh, theta and z. Okay, so you cannot give Maple this kind of expression because Maple does not know how to interpret it. Uh, so uh, this makes things a little bit more complicated, but uh, uh, there is actually... There would be other uh, plotting comments. Uh, so if you if you look at this one, then uh, you see that uh, we could we could try to use implicit implicit plot 3D, which which should work as here as well. Or is there something cylindrical? Uh, uh, we would also have one which is uh, with respect to cylindrical pl cylindrical plot. But I guess the interpretation of cylinder plot. You see, you have also one which is can be used as well in order to uh, plot. Uh, uh, Surfaces which are given in cylindrical coordinates. So let's, uh, but I guess it's the same syntax. Uh, you see that this is a second point. So if L is just a normal expression, then L is uh, uh, represents the give the radius given in terms of the other coordinates. Okay, so actually, uh, uh, this means that uh, for Maple, this would be uh, implicit. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, could, we could do it by using uh, an implicit plot, uh, uh, or we, can, we, we could just write it in, in a different form. Okay, so let's, let's rewrite this in terms of So R is with respect to F and theta, so we have the square root of Z. And Z is at most 5 half. Now, uh, again, I have to adjust the plotting window. Okay, uh, so let's really try it implicit. I actually want to stick to this form here. Implicit plot 3D. Now, here... Uh, uh, but okay, uh, I'm not sure whether I should spend time to plot it like this because I have to look at the help as well. I'm not doing this very often, uh, so. Uh, uh, but uh, if you, I, I just tell you how that this kind of implicit plot. Uh,
You see, also for this implicit plot, you have the usual plot options, uh, which I explained here. Uh, so you can use the usual plot option, uh, options. So also in this case, uh, you can either specify by uh, uh, by a, uh, you can either give a surface which is in uh, Cartesian coordinates or in other coordinates. Uh, okay, but I'm not so sure about the syntax, so I'm not going uh, I'm not going to figure this out. It's not so complicated. Uh, you just have to read the uh, help, uh, but it would take a little bit time to figure it out. And I want to sh I want to show you different plots. Uh, uh, afterwards, uh, okay. But you see, essentially, if you use Maple, uh, normally sometimes it's you have to uh, 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 try to figure out how to do it. But you have a very good help uh, uh, option here. Uh, so most of the comments are explained here in uh, details. And maybe I will give some assi assignments from the, because in the textbook you see there are quite a lot of uh, assignments which involve plotting something. Uh, I haven't I haven't yet. Uh, uh, given you such assignments. Uh, but I think, uh, think since I know that all of you have access to Maple, to our online version of Maple, uh, maybe I will, uh, for the next assignments, I will give you some assignments where you have to plot also something. And then you can uh, uh, try to figure out how to do it by looking also at the help option and so on. Uh, uh, just as you see that Maple for plotting, in particular plotting surfaces in the, s in the space, is a very, very powerful uh, tool. Now, uh, for surfaces, they are normally not so complicated to visualize, but we will see that uh, 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 that if you have curves in the space, okay, so it's something in the space, this is normally pretty hard to visualize if you do not have access to a, a, a plotting device uh, like Maple provides, uh, because uh, uh, if you have some, if you have curves, uh, and this is this is something we will we, we want to discuss next. Uh, if you have curves in the space, okay, sometimes if you just if you just try to, if you just plot it onto the uh, blackboard, okay, you do not know whether one point is above another. Or, uh, so if you see something, the two curves are crossing each other, it's not certain that they cross because m one point might be higher than the other one. So uh, in particular for curves in the three-dimensional space, uh, uh, you uh, certainly need access to a good plotting uh, program that you have, uh, uh, that you are able to visualize them. So uh, in the next in next chapter, which is chapter thirteen, uh, we are we will we are going to discuss uh, vector functions uh, and space curves. Now, uh, a vector function is. Uh, is an ordinary is an ordinary function as we have discussed uh, uh, last semester. The only difference being that uh, uh, you map real numbers onto vectors. Uh, so the uh, the domain of the function. Uh, so we will notice like something like this here. Okay. So the domain of the function will be uh, uh, the real numbers uh, or, or or some subset of the real numbers. Uh, and uh, maybe I should write it like D, so maybe some subset of the real numbers. Uh, uh, but the image of any, any point from the real numbers will be in the three-dimensional uh, vector space. So we have a function now which maps uh, real numbers onto uh, vectors. Such a function uh, is called uh, a vector function. Now, uh, uh, of course, most of the time we will uh, write the vector function as uh, uh, three functions which make up the three coordinates, uh, let's say f of t, uh, g of t, and h of t. And those three functions are called the component functions. OK, so uh, actually, uh, uh, Vector function, you could replace here the dimension 3 by any other dimension, but we will stick to this uh, special situation uh, where, the, uh, uh, where we are in the space. Uh, and the component fun uh, and in, in this case, you can look at the vector function as uh, three ordinary functions, which make, make up the three components. Uh, uh, now, uh, what we essentially want to do is, for such vector functions, we want to define uh, things like limits, uh, uh, continuous, uh, derivatives, and integrals. It's pretty easy for this situation. Uh, 
No? Uh, for the, so for the first definition, let's maybe look at the definition of the limit. Okay, so how is the limit defined? So we have a limit, uh, uh, t tends to t0 uh, of the vector function. How, uh, how, is, the, how is the symbol defined? Uh, no? uh, uh, by definition, uh, this limit is just the limit of the three component functions. And for the component functions, we know how to compute the limit because uh, uh, a component function is just a function, a usual function, uh, as we have discussed uh, uh, last semester. So. Uh, The limit of a vector function is defined like this here. So you can say that the, uh, the limit is defined just component-wise for every component. You, uh, uh, you consider the limit. And we said that this limit here exists if all of those limits, if the three limits here exist. Then we say the limit exists. Otherwise, it, the limit does not exist. Now, uh, this is. Uh, this is one way, actually, to define the limit. Another way would be to uh, use a definition which uh, uh, uses a, uh, epsilon and delta, as we have done last semester. But uh, uh, for such a def definition, so uh, if you have a usual function here, normally you define the limit as, OK, for all epsilon, you have a delta. And if uh, t is within a delta interval of t0, then the f of t must be within an epsilon interval of the uh, f t0. Uh, of the of the limit of the claimed limit, uh, so this would be uh, the definition. Uh, if you, uh, this is the definition we have seen last semester for a function of one variable. But now we have uh, uh, still a function of one variable, but the image are vectors. Uh, so uh, uh, you have first to say, okay, how do you measure the distance of the claimed limit, which is a vector, to the vector function? And because we are in the three-dimensional space, we know the distance, the so normally the so-called Euclidean distance, normal distance, which you, the distance which you will use between two points, okay, which is computed with Pythagoras' theorem. So you could give an equivalent definition as follows. Okay, so for all epsilon larger than zero, uh, so maybe I should first write what, what am, I, am I going to define. Uh, so the limit as t tends to t zero uh, R of t is equal to some limit L. Uh, OK, so this means that, by definition, for all epsilon larger than 0, there exists a delta uh, such that uh, for all t, uh, where the distance uh, between t and t0 larger than 0 but smaller or equal than delta, we have uh, uh, that the distance between uh, R and of t and L is smaller or equal than epsilon. But uh, in order to measure this distance, what we use is the uh, what we normally uh, denote by this here. Uh, okay, smaller or equal than epsilon. And uh, uh, this this is just the length of the vector x. Uh, so it's x square plus y square plus z square. Okay, so this would be another way to define the limit. And uh, uh, it's one of the exercises in our textbook to show that those two definitions are equivalent. Okay, so whether you define the limit like this here or you define the limit like this, what you get, of course, is the same. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, you can s you can think of your own how to prove this is not very complicated. Uh, okay, so you have to prove that two directions. You have to prove that uh, if this limit here uh, is equal to L using this definition, then uh, you for, for, for all epsilon, you, find, you can find a delta such that this holds. Uh, and the other way around, uh, if the limit relation holds in this sense here, then uh, uh, it's just component-wise. OK, so, so those two ways of defining a limit are equivalent. OK, so actually, I should write here, because uh, this is not a definition for us, uh, so uh, those two here are equivalent. And this is something you have. You, you have to prove one of the exercises in our textbook asks you to prove this. Not very complicated. OK. Uh, uh, something else which can be proved and uh, uh, which uh, uh, actually uh, corresponds to our intuition what the limit should be. So uh, if, if the limit, for instance, now of course here we are in the three dimensional space, but uh, let's for, the, for a moment stick to the 
two-dimensional vector space. Uh, so uh, if uh, if this here uh, is supposed to be the limit, okay, then uh, what will happen with the uh, with the sequence of vectors? Uh, so let's say this is not t zero. This is uh, t one. Uh, this is r of t two. So as 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 the t is approaching t zero, okay. Uh, you, uh, what you will see if you plot those vectors is that the uh, that they also approach in the uh, this vector l, okay, in, in the sense you would expect, namely that the length of this sequence of vectors, okay, approaches the length of l, and uh, uh, the direction will become the same, okay. So uh, uh, this limit relation holds if and only if. Uh, the lengths uh, converge. Uh, the lengths uh, uh, of uh, uh, these vectors converge to the length of L in the usual sense, and the directions converge. Okay, but for the directions we have never defined this. Okay, so it's not clear what this is supposed to mean that the directions converge to each other. But it should be clear from this picture here. So uh, if you uh, uh, plot vectors here for t closer and closer to t zero, those vectors in this sense here, which you see here, really approach L. I think there is also a ex another exercise in our textbook which asks you to prove that if this relation holds, then the lengths here will converge to the length of this one. Another easy exercise. OK, so this is limits. Uh, once we have limits, uh, we can define the notation of continuous. Uh, so a vector function will be called continuous. Given vector function is called continuous. If uh, at at some point at t zero, if okay, so as you would expect it, uh, if this limit here exists, then can just be computed by evaluating the vector function at t is equal to t zero. So in this case, the uh, uh, the vector function is called, called continuous. Uh, and uh, because uh, the limit is uh, defined component-wise, uh, so this means that the vector function is continuous uh, uh, either in a point or on an interval if and only if all the component functions are continuous in the point or on an interval or, or on some general uh, domain. So uh, for vector functions, you define everything limits uh, and continuous vector functions uh, uh, just by defining it for the component functions. Now the next thing is, uh, because uh, uh, in the SQL most of the time we are going to look at continuous vector functions, uh, uh, the next thing is, uh, or the next thing which is defined in our textbook is uh, a so-called space curve. Uh, uh, so you, uh, whenever you have uh, uh, three continuous functions, Then uh, uh, the curve, which is given by the parametric equations, okay, so x is equal to, so t is the parameter, so you have this one, y is equal to g of t and z is equal to h of t uh, uh, will be called a space curve. OK, and you see that you have a natural correspondence between space curves and vector functions. Namely, if you interpret these uh, three functions here as the component functions of a vector function, then you uh, uh, get a vector function which uh, corresponds to this space curve here. Of course, there is a little bit of difference between a curve uh, and a vector function because a vector function gives you uh, the images. For every parameter, you have a vector, and the space curve uh, gives you a point in the three-dimensional space. So the space curve is the curve which is traced out by the tips of the vectors of the corresponding vector function. 
Okay, so for every, but for every, uh, uh, you can interpret a vector uh, function uh, as a space curve, and the other way around. It's, you can interpret the space curve as a uh, continuous vector function. So there is a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence. You can also think about the space curve as just a graph of the vector function, in some sense. Okay, so this is just notation. Now, uh, uh, actually, we have seen already uh, one example for such a. Uh, we have seen more examples, but uh, uh, we have discussed one example in chapter twelve, uh, namely a line. Uh, so a line. Uh, if you look at the vector form of a line, so we describe the line by some point uh, plus uh, uh, all multiples of a given vector uh, in which the in which direction the line points, uh, uh, and uh, this, the, the vector equation of, of the line is, ex is actu actually a vector function, and the line itself is the space curve corresponding to the vector function. I should so if I introduce coordinates, so for this point, the coordinates x0, y0, z0, and from this APC, then uh, okay, where uh, v has coordinates a, b, and c, and uh, x uh, and r0 has coordinates. Uh, x0, y0, z0. Okay, so this situation we have already discussed. Uh, uh, you should, you should maybe uh, once more, I wanna once more stress there is a little bit of difference, of course, between those two here because here you have vectors, set of vec here you have uh, a set of vectors uh, indexed by t, and uh, here you have points in the three-dimensional in the space. So uh, there's a little bit of difference, but. Uh, uh, this is this is what we call here the space curve, and it's the corresponding uh, vector function. Okay, now uh, something. Uh, for unfortunately, I have just five minutes left, but something uh, uh, I want to discuss in a few details. Uh, uh, also, uh, starting today and next time is uh, uh, how to uh, pr uh, plot uh, space curves. This is something. Which is normally complicated. So it's not so for space curves. It's normally quite complicated if you have a complicated space curve to visualize it. Uh, the the reason being that uh, uh, e even so, if you are able to plot it on the blackboard, okay, uh, you still from a plot normally you do not see if, if you have something like uh, okay, which is supposed to be a space curve, okay, then you cannot see whether okay does the curve really intersect itself here or is this point higher than the other one, okay, so. For a space curve, you certainly have to see, it's certainly necessary that you see it from different directions that you understand how the uh, space curve uh, looks like here. Now, uh, for some easy examples, it's not so complicated to figure out how the space curve corresponding to a vector function looks like. Here. So for instance, For instance, if you have the vector function r of t is equal to, so let's say, cosine of t i plus sine of t j plus uh, t k. Okay, so let's say it, uh, this is our vector function. What is the corresponding space curve? Uh, so the parametric equations of the space curve is x is equal to cosine of t, y is equal to sine of t, and z is equal to t. Now in this in this case it's easy even without graphing device it's easy to figure out how how the space curve looks like so some trick in order to to plot uh, an easy trick in order to plot space curves is uh, you first identify a surface on which which you know on which the space curve is located so you see from uh, from those two you get x square plus y square is equal to one so you see that this space curve okay is on the circular cylinder so this helps you already. This helps already in understanding how the uh, space curve looks like. OK. 
Okay, because you know that. Okay, so you you know that that uh, that our uh, space curve okay must lie uh, on this cylinder here. Now uh, the only thing which you have to observe is okay you you will start you will start here, and then uh, the st is growing okay. So actually you are walking around the circle, and uh, uh, at the same time if you look at set, uh, uh, you are going to uh, move upwards okay. So you have something like. And this is the direction which you go. OK, so here it's not so hard to visualize. You see this kind of trick to first identify a surface on which the space curve uh, 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 lies. Uh, it's r rather useful in order to plot this space curve here, because uh, uh, you see that uh, once you know that the space curve is on this uh, uh, surface, okay, this helps you to, to understand in some sense how, how the space curve looked like. Also, you see it, there you have a direction because uh, 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 ST is uh, uh, getting larger and larger, you will move up. Uh, okay, so normally you also have to, to identify uh, the direction. Uh, and this space curve is called helix. Uh, uh, a space curve you might be familiar from uh, uh, genetics. Uh, uh, or the human DNA, which is which can be modeled uh, by using two helix, which are intertwined. The picture, which I guess everyone has uh, seen. So, so th th this is one which is important in uh, applications. We will next time we will look at some more examples. So some of the space curves uh, you are able to uh, uh, plot rather easily by identifying a surface on which they are uh, in which they are contained. Uh, but sometimes uh, it's not so easy, and then uh, 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 I will show you next time uh, once more that Maple is a very, very good tool in order to plot uh, curves and surfaces uh, uh, in the space. Uh, and since we are uh, uh, starting from this uh, chapter, also chapter 14 and 15, we are talking then about functions of two variables uh, uh, whose, uh, or more than two variables whose uh, graph is a uh, surface. Uh, so you should uh, really take some time and uh, 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 and uh, play a little bit around with Maple to see how powerful Maple is in order to uh, uh, plot uh, surfaces and space curves. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm.